so much for coming. Uh, this is our traditional Saturday lunch, except not quite traditional. As you may recall, this event is usually the University of Virginia's debates. Uh, several people have asked me, uh, am I now insisting on both debating and being the moderator of the debate? <laughs> uh, this is not that thing, but that just seems like a great idea. So we'll do that next uh, year. But uh, this year, instead, we're doing, uh, we're doing this debate actually at 4 p.m. today. It's a new contact, a spectacular event with uh, Ron George and John McGinnis, debating the nature of the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> Uh, but today, we're very lucky and happy to have Tristan Powers, uh, author of the book that, is, uh, that was on your chair while okay, you sat down and signed it. It's a terrific book and an extremely uh, timely book given uh, recent events on campus. So, Tristan, welcome. Thank Thanks for having me. <clears throat> it's great to be here. Thank you. <laughs> So we're going to jump right in. We have to begin talking about the recent events at Yale. I'm just going to, I think most of the people in this room are familiar, but I'm just going to summarize some of the facts. You know, I just went to Yale undergrad and Yale Law School, and it was all actually uh, quite um, distressing to mm -hmm. me. So, uh, and what happened uh, recently was the Yale administration sent out an email to uh, everyone, uh, all students. Uh, asking that they be mindful of their choice of Halloween costumes. They were warned that some costumes might give offense, and particularly costumes which are culturally appropriated, might uh, offend some people, and so to be mindful of that and be careful. Um, some examples include about uh, wearing the Indian headdress, that sort of thing, Native American headdress, I guess I should say. So, the master of civil men is a guy named Nicholas Christiak. Silverman is a resident of college at Yale. His wife, Erica Christiak, is an associate master. And she sent an email around uh, in response to this email. And it was uh, it's really quite mild. I thought it was quite just a little flavor of it. Quote, I don't wish to trivialize genuine concerns about cultural and personal representation and other challenges to our lived experience and plural community. I know that many pieces of people who put guidelines on Halloween costumes in the spirit of avoiding hurt and offense. I lack those goals in theory, as most of us do, but in practice, I wonder if they should reflect more transparently as a community on the consequences of an institutional, which is to say, bureaucratic and administrative exercise of implied control over college students. Uh, she goes on to say, I don't actually trust myself to voice my Halloween standards and motives on others. She urges that if you see someone, uh, if you see, if you don't like a costume someone is wearing, look away or tell them you're offended, they talk to each other. Free speech and the ability to tolerate offense are the hallmarks of a free and open society. <laughs> The reaction to that email was swift and severe. Hundreds of Yale students protested, arguing that uh, because of the content of this email, actually she and her husband should be removed from their posts as master and deputy master of Silverman College. When the master, her husband, walked into the courtyard the next day, I believe, he was surrounded by 50 or 100 students who um, really berated him at length for the content of this email. He was uh, you know, a paragon of reason and, uh, um, and uh, reason and um, reasonableness in the face of this mob, actually, at uh, Yale. And that, um, that uh, event in Silliman culminated in this moment, which was captured on video by uh, Greg Piano, the uh, president of FIRE, on the board of and a friend of 
hours. So this was a touch fun video, but I just happened to be in the room. Can we roll that video? The exception is because other people have rights too, not just walk, you. Walk away. Walk away. It doesn't deserve to be listened to. It's an unsafe space here for all humans. Be quiet. For all humans. Do you understand that? As your position as master, it is your job to create a place of comfort and home for the students that live in Tillman. You have not done that. By sending out that email, that goes against your position as master. Do you understand that? Then no, I stop. don't agree with that. Then, then why the fuck did you accept the position? Because Who I have the a fuck hired you? I have a different vision. You should you. step down. If that is what you think about being a master, you should step down. It is not about creating an intellectual space. It is not. Do you understand that? It's about creating a home here. You are not doing that. You're supposed You're to be our advocate. This, this, you should be at the event last night when you hear a Franco say that she didn't know how to create a safe space for her freshman instillment. How do you explain that? These freshmen come here and they think this is what Yale is? Do you hear that? They're going to leave. They're going to transfer because you are a poor steward of the community. You should not sleep at night. We're out. We out. We you are out. disgusting. I, I want to apologize to you for the language in the video, but honestly, I don't feel that I could have conveyed that as well as let you actually see what uh, happened. So, subsequent to that, the Yale administration has sent out an email uh, confirming that they care both about diversity on campus and the experience of the minorities, uh, and also they care about uh, free speech, they say. Uh, but the email conspicuously does not actually offer up any words of support for uh, Master Stiatis, and that makes us a bit uh, nervous about it. So, Kirsten, can you tell us how we think about this? What's happening here? Well, and then also there's been, is, can you guys hear me? Yeah, so, so subsequently also the, he, the professor has given this very Maoist, coerced apology, um, you know, really, you know, falling all over himself to apologize for having somehow done something wrong. And if you watch the extended version of this, you can see that he is, he's completely surrounded by these students, um, and he's actually getting screamed at for turning his back on people who are in a circle around him. <laughs> no, truly. And he, and, he, and he is doing this. I'm so sorry. Just, you know, like, the, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not turning my back to you. You know, and they're, they're yelling at him. And um, he could not have been more obsequious, frankly, uh, you know, trying to convince them, you know, that, but that he just had a disagreement with them. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't tolerate it, and then another girl in the, the group, I'm sorry, a woman, I'm sure I would get in trouble for calling her girl, um, another woman in the group says, you know, she says, where's your apology? You know, we're just not hearing an apology, and if you're not going to apologize, then there's nothing to talk about, and he keeps saying, I, I don't agree with you, you know, and it, they absolutely will not accept the idea of disagreement. And then, unfortunately, there are other videos that we, we don't have time to play. There's one at Claremont McKenna, a similar situation where you're having administrators berated um, for, you know, for what we don't know exactly because, unfortunately, the, the, the actual um, descriptions of these incidents that are allegedly happening are very scarce. Uh, we're not actually getting any information about why these students are so outraged, except to say they claim there's a pattern of of discrimination and oppression on, on uh, campuses, but they're not really saying exactly what's happening to them. Yeah. So this is not an isolated event. No, right? not this even is, remotely isolated. So this is a, some sort of trend. This is yeah. some sort, so what is causing this? How is this happening? Well, that's a great question. I think, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of commentary talking about how the, the students are so fragile, that they're little snowflakes, that the, it's helicopter parents have, have, have caused this because they expect everything to go their way. And I think that that is a separate problem. You know, I think that that is true. We do have very entitled, sort of privileged, delicate uh, students, but ultimately, I think that these students are bullies, and I think that they are—they're um, manipulative, and they are ideologically driven for the most part, and they want to get their way. 
and they're going to do whatever they can to get their way. They want people fired. They're getting people fired. We're having resignations. At Claremont McKenna, there were resignations. I mean, we've seen in Missouri what's happening, where people are being, uh, being forced. The president is forced to resign, even though the Federalist has today. Uh, they did, I think, a, some sort of FOIA request and got all the information about what happened out there when there was this swastika that was painted in a bathroom. Um, and it turns out that the administration responded ex immediately. They called the police. They reached out to the campus Jewish group that was very, you know, said thank you for telling us. Uh, they, they, you know, they, they, they sent, you know, they reached out to all the students. They handled everything perfectly, and yet we were told that they, they did nothing, and that's not even true. Um, and then, and yet, you have the president being forced to resign. And so, you know, I think that this is, and you know, and. After having written the book that I wrote, none of this is surprising to me. You know, it is exactly the type of stuff that's been happening sort of around the country uh, on our campuses where um, the people who really are the bullies are describing themselves as the victims, um, and they are demanding that, you know, either you immediately capitulate to their demands or they'll destroy your life. So many people here may not be aware of some of the some of the dimensions of this, and your book is chock full of mm -hmm. incredibly compelling, chilling anecdotes. If you could just explain to people some of these key ideas. So, what is a trigger warning, and what is a microaggression? Oh yeah. So, um, so a trigger warning is now students are demanding trigger warnings on a, a syllabus. Uh, if if there's going to be anything discussed in the class or anything that they might have to read that could potentially trigger them. And I think most people probably know tr trigger is a psychological term. It would be used typically for PTSD. So, um, but they're using it for things like colonialism or sexism um, or racism or anything that might come up um, and that they need to be, or anything related to sexual assault, so that they need to be warned in advance. And then they also, not just warned in advance, but excused from actually studying what uh, might trigger them, excuse from any class where they might be triggered. Um, and this is, I think most professors feel this is a sort of infringement on their academic freedom. And the students don't feel the same way. They, they really believe that, they, that they, they really are going to be so emotionally traumatized and harmed by being exposed to these things that they should be warned. And so, for example, students have de demanded trigger warnings for such assignments as The Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby, exactly. Uh, for assignments like yes. uh, the reading of Greek myths. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, and they, and, and, and some professors at Oberlin, in fact, the professors pushed back against this and said, you know, if I have to say, say a suicide occurs in a piece of literature, it kind of ruins. This, the, whole, the whole idea of reading the book in the first place. You know, and so they don't, and, and basically Oberlin administrators came back and said, well, yes, that, that's true, but it always is more important to protect the students' feelings uh, than, to, you know, than to expose them to something that could potentially traumatize them, which, which any psychiatrist will tell you is actually the opposite of how you handle a trauma victim. A trauma victim, you do not isolate them from what has traumatized them. You actually have to be exposed to it, and you have to learn to be able to, to deal with it. And so what these administrators are doing is they're actually enabling students. I mean, assuming the student legitimately is going to be traumatized. Let's just, so most of them, I think, are not. Um, uh, because again, most of these are, they're not really about suicide. Most of them are ideologically driven. So, um, but let's just say someone is legitimately going to be traumatized. That's an opportunity for intervention. You know, to say, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have a mental breakdown over the Great Gatsby, then we need to get you into a counseling program and we need to get you help. <laughs> you know, I mean, truly, I'm saying that in all sincerity. And, um, you know, and, in, and instead, they're enabling it. You know, and then I think we all can figure out what's going to happen to these students when they leave campus. Because there are going to be no trigger warnings. You know, at Wellesley, they had a, an absolute, they just, uh, all these students had a meltdown because there was a, a statue. Uh, and it was, a, it was called the Sleepwalker. And it was a man, it was, it, and he was in underwear, and he was like this, and it's just a statue. And they were, uh, claimed that they were made to feel unsafe, um, and that they wanted trigger warnings for it because they shouldn't have to see this, and, that, and it causes this huge outcry, um, and that they actually felt that they were being physically intimidated and harmed by an inanimate object. <laughs> um, and you know, and so you know, it's like, what's gonna happen when they just start walking around in the world? You know, and they see things, and, and, and yet they really believe, and then frankly, they have a lot of professors and administrators who are affirming this, that they should be protected from anything that upsets them. 
So our mutual friend Greg Lukianoff and John Haidt, who you just mentioned, wrote a terrific article in mm -hmm. the Atlantic Monthly on just this point, right. um, uh, taking these claims seriously and taking the claim seriously that you might be triggered by something in a piece of literature. Actually, it's unhealthy to shield you from that exactly. thing forever as a psychological matter. Right. And just, right. uh, you know, whether or not those, these claims are. Um, often real. Uh, sometimes maybe they are, but even when they are, the di the, um, the diagnosis is counterproductive. So, right. You know. Yeah, but they, you know, I, I was just at Wellesley, and I, you know, and and smart kids talking to them. I mean, they're adults, but they, you know, they're obviously young adults, and they, and the trigger warning situation came up, and I, you know. Had this back and forth with a student there who kept insisting that they, sh you know, that they should have, to, that they should be required. Professors should be required to have trigger warnings. And I kept saying, like, no. If a professor wants to have a trigger warning, they can do that. Um, but they don't should not be required. It is an infringement on their academic freedom. And she just, you know, she kept pushing back, and we kept going back and forth. And eventually, she started crying. And this is actually something that is, uh, other people who go on university campuses will tell you. And, and again, this is Wellesley. This is not, I mean, these are supposed to be, you know, some of the smartest women, you know, in the country, theoretically. And, um, you know, and so, you know, and, and at least, and they're supposed to, theoretically, a feminist place. And I had to say to them, like, you, this is not, this is not feminist if you can't handle, you know, disagreement. If you can't handle somebody just merely disagreeing with you and that you, and uh, you know, because another one was insisting to me that, um, that pe speech, anytime somebody speaks to her and makes her feel like they don't respect her as a woman, that that speech should not be protected speech. That that person should be reported. Um, it was never clear to me to whom, whether it was, I kept trying to get her to tell me, like, is this the you know, university administrator or is this, you know, the government? And she wasn't quite sure, but that somebody needed to be, you know, alerted to this and, and needed to be, you know, need, needed to be stopped because they were taking away her power. You know, and I was saying to her, like, no, you're giving away your power if you do that, but nobody can actually take away your power, and this is not feminist, and I don't know where you guys are getting the idea that it is. But they really were sincere. I think that that's the thing that was the most troubling to me. Is it, I, I wasn't getting the screaming and the yelling and the hysterics. I was getting some very sincerely confused students who have been taught, somebody taught them this. You know, they did not come up with this on their own. Um, they, they really have, have been indoctrinated. What is a microaggression? Yes, and a microaggression. So, what, you know, what's interesting about a lot of the um, a lot of the incidents that are in my book and then that have happened since my book came out, um, speech is cast as actual violence. Okay, so th this is this is how they have sort of reframed free speech: is that you, when you say say something to them that they don't like, you are it is an act of aggression. So a microaggression is when you say something to somebody that you do not realize is going is offensive to them. It's it's racist or it's sexist or it's ableist or it's cisgendered, which we can explain in a bit, um, and you know all these different things, and you don't even realize that you're doing it. And but, but by merely by saying something that you don't realize that you're saying, you have you actually committed an act of aggression that is akin to a physical attack. And an example of a microaggression that comes up a lot is that you say to somebody, a person of color, where are you from? And that's a microaggression because you are suggesting that they're not actually really Americans, even though you're just making, usually making polite conversation in my experience. Um, and so you say, and, but truly, like if you, if, you, if you say to somebody, or if you say, oh, where's your family, you know, they say, oh, I'm from California. Oh, where's your family originally from? That, that's a microaggression. And there's a, there's a big case out at the University of California I can't remember which one. one of, the University of California system is just, I mean, it's the mother load of, of these kinds of stories. Um, but they, there, were, there was a professor who, 80-year-old uh, professor who had been, you know, he's a multicultural expert and uh, was surrounded, a bunch of students of color marched in and surrounded him and accused him of creating an unsafe environment for uh, scholars of color. And one of their examples was he had changed the word, a uh, capitalized indigenous to the lowercase indigenous, which would be grammatically correct. And that was a microaggression because it was disrespecting the students' political views or ide you know, ideology. And the uh, University of California administrators sent out an email to the all yep. the entire faculty 
uh, warning them to beware of microaggressions and yep. offering up as a couple of helpful examples, quote, I believe the most qualified person should get the job. It's a microaggression. Close quote. <laughs> Proud American is another uh, one. America is the yeah. land of opportunity. Yeah. Microaggression in, yeah. at the, in the UC system. Yeah. yeah. You're not supposed to refer yourself even as an American, according to the University of California, because it's, it's a microaggression against people from South America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, these are real things, and these are real guidelines that are put up at, at a state-funded university, which is um, you know, supposed to be respecting people's free speech. And you know, creating a real, there was a, Another one was that they said that we could no longer use the word uh, mothering or fathering. Um, you could only say parenting because they didn't want to imply that there was such a thing as mothering or fathering. Uh, so I teach at Georgetown Law School and uh, we have a full-time faculty of 125. And our uh, liberal conservative ratio is we are 123 to two. Uh, that's, that's very diverse, actually. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm sad to say that there are zero conservatives or libertarians at Georgetown currently, because I think we're both uh, here. Yeah. So that's. Right. <laughs> But, uh, and at uh, Yale, for example, uh, if you look at campaign donations, 96.8% right. went to Obama in the last mm -hmm. election. Now, to what extent is something like the recent Yale uh, controversy caused by, derived from this extreme ideological imbalance on campus? I think it. I think that is probably the root cause of these kinds of things because people will say to me, you know, why is this happening? And there are a lot of different theories, and I think that there are actually a lot of different reasons that this is happening that we could probably get into. But the overarching one in my mind is it's happening because it can, and because you have no ideological diversity, and when you take a bunch of people that all think exactly the same way, it's very easy just to believe that you're right, everybody else is wrong, uh, there's no check or balance, you know, they have just complete authority uh, with nobody questioning them, and they have gotten to a place where they just, I, I think the important thing to remember about this is they really believe what they're doing is quite righteous. You know, they're not aware, they, they believe that what they're doing is good for society and it's good for the university and um, that they are somehow advancing, you know, all of these great causes, these social, they, they, they believe they're advancing social justice even though they're not. Um, but they believe they're advancing social justice and so therefore, if there's nobody there to counter that, uh, that view, if there's nobody there who um, could maybe disprove some of the caricatures and stereotypes they have about people who are different than them, then I think that this is sort of the natural conclusion of, you know, of, of what would happen uh, in that environment. And students don't know how to behave when confronted with an idea that they don't agree with because it happens right. so infrequently. Right, and exactly. They're so rarely yeah. confronted with it. And, and I've seen this too. I saw this when I was at Wellesley when I would sort of, you know, take them and ask, when I started to ask for specifics, everything just fell apart. It just really, they, they clearly had never been asked to really defend anything that they believed, and, and other you know, liberal professors who have been critical of this, uh, uh, this phenomenon have said the same thing, that they, they, they're like, well, I'm liberal, I agree with them, but they really don't know how to defend what they believe. And again, if we go back to what's happening in Missouri or at Yale, or they, you're told over and over that there is this systemic problem, but they don't have any examples. You know, other than we'll point to one thing, you know, or, or very generalized, you know, well, somebody drove past me in a truck and said the N-word. And it's like, well, that's not systemic. That's, that's a bad incident, and that's a bad thing that happened. But that's not what systemic means. And there is no expectation from our media for some reason to, you know, to ask, what do you mean by systemic, that to the point that you think somebody should be fired? You know, and what, what, is, what is the university professor supposed to do anyway about somebody driving by and saying something? I'm not quite sure how the administrator is supposed to stop that from happening. We're not having these conversations. It's just this mob mentality, and then people's lives are destroyed. I think one of the great contributions of this book is your framework for describing the 
liberal left and the illiberal left. I think it's a very useful distinction. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? What do you mean by the illiberal yeah. left? Yeah, what I mean by that is that the people who are doing this call themselves liberal. Um, and, and but they're behaving in this incredibly illiberal manner, and so they've just thrown out the, all ideas about free speech. In fact, they're completely contemptuous to the idea of free speech if it conflicts with their ideological agenda versus, I think, sincere liberals um, who still believe in free speech, and they are still out there. Um, I think a lot of them are scared, frankly, uh, about, about speaking up. But I, I did an event at Georgetown a couple weeks ago, and there was a professor there named Phil Zuckerman, and he's a secular studies professor um, at a school out in California, and he's a very liberal, he's atheist, and um, you know he was very intellectually honest. And he read my book. He, he was asked to respond to my book, and he said, "I went in. I, I was ready to rip it apart. I was sure I was going to hate it." And he said, "You know, I, I read it two times, and there's not one thing in here that I can disagree with. And I'm ashamed, and I'm embarrassed. You know, and th th this is not." And he said, "And I'm. And he said, and I'm ashamed and embarrassed that we that liberal students will not let conservative speakers come onto campuses, but then Bernie Sanders can go talk to Liberty University and be treated with total respect." And you know, Nick Kristoff wrote last week. Um, uh, Nick Kristoff wrote last week about how he and he said explicitly in his column, "This is coming from the left. It is not. This is not something that's a both sides kind of does it. This is coming from the left." And he similarly said, "I go to evangelical college schools. I go to Catholic schools. I talk about being pro gay marriage, pro choice, and a Democrat." No problem. I have never had a problem. Uh, so uh, John Haidt believes that the liberal left actually wildly outnumbers the illiberal left, though the illiberal left is much more vocal. Yeah. And that our strategy here is to let this play out, and eventually the liberal left will rise up and uh, defeat the illiberal left. And our job is to. Uh, watch that happen, really. Um, is, is, is that? This is kind of fun, let's admit it. it <laughs> but so, so is that right? Is that, no, is, um, I, I don't think it's, I don't completely agree with that because, I mean, there's a couple of things that are wrong with this, is that a lot of this has been, this, I think most people in this room probably know, anybody who's conservative knows that this has been actually going on for quite some time. And conservatives have ha been having their lives quietly destroyed. It doesn't make national news when people are denied tenure. It doesn't, you know, it, this doesn't, doesn't make national news when you can't get a, a job or you, I mean, Jonathan Haidt talks about when he gave his speech to the social psychology, you know, their annual conference, and he said, I just wanted to find uh, a conservative social psychologist to talk to, and he said, I couldn't find a single one. And so he found two people who were not conservative and not liberal. They, had, they were independents, essentially. And he said they reminded him of closeted gays in the 1970s because they were so fearful about even talking about the few views they had that didn't, weren't, weren't liberal. And that, and that one of them said, I just can't even stay in. I, I'm going to have to leave. Like I can't even pursue a career in this because I feel like I will never be able to pursue the kind of research I want to do because they're not going to be open to it. So, so this has already been happening. And so I think what I find very troubling is, is now the, liberal, the liberal liberals are getting interested, but why are they getting interested? Because liberals are being silenced. And so there, there's a problem there. Like they, they need, and they need to acknowledge that. Like they need to acknowledge that it's not OK to do this to conservatives. It's not OK to drive Christian groups off of campus and to and stay silent while that is happening. And now suddenly, out of self-interest, you know, get get involved in this. So I guess we should be thankful that out of self-interest they've gotten involved in it. Um, but they, I think that they need to acknowledge that. And um, and I, and then I also think that um, I, I'm not sure that that many of them are going to rise up against this. So we'll have to wait and see about that because we see look, we're seeing what ha look, look what happened to this professor at Yale. I mean, we'll, we'll see if he gets to keep his job um, because they're they're demanding that both he and his wife now are forced to resign. And so I don't know. There was there was an article in the liberal website Vox. Um, I'm sure you know this. The headline was "I'm a liberal pro professor and I'm terrified of my liberal students," and he wrote it under a pseudonym because he's that fearful of his liberal students. And you know, and he said it's it's gotten he what it. 
his response to this is that he now scrubs his syllabus of anything that could offend a liberal student, and that's what the other liberal professors are doing. Yep. Um, because uh, he, he brought up a, a professor who was an adjunct who did not have their contract renewed because they had signed a book by Mark Twain, and a student was offended. And so the contract was not renewed. So are there that many people that are really going to be willing to stand up when you have somebody who's writing under a pseudonym and scrubbing their, you know, scrubbing their syllabus? I, I don't know. Um, I also don't believe, another thing that people say is they say it's so ridiculous and absurd it's going to collapse under its own weight. And I, I don't know why something so successful would collapse. You know, if, if they're getting people fired and they're getting what they want, why, why are they going to stop doing it? We keep thinking that we're at the point of terminal silliness, and this right. audience actually wants to laugh at these stories, but e each time we think we're at the end, a new one, a new, ha new right. thing happens, and actually lives are being destroyed. Yeah, and then, then also we have to remember, there's a lot of things that are happening that aren't as dramatic as what we watched, and so they're not going to get, they're not going to create, uh, you know, any kind of national news story, but they're sort of just happening, it's the chilling effect that's happening every single day on these campuses. So it's all the people who just aren't saying things because they don't want this to happen to them. And when I was writing my book, actually, I was uh, talking, I went to a, a dinner party with some friends, and there were three conservative academics there, two former, one because she was Basically, she, she was denied a promotion. This is at a Washington area school um, because, and this was in writing, she somehow got a hold of the email. They suspected she was conservative. And um, even though she, she's very, you know, it had nothing to do with what she was teaching, uh, the other was retired from Stanford and said, she's like, I don't even know how I, I did it, you know, how I made it through it. It was, it was so horrible. And then the third person was a, a law student at Harvard Law, and he said, I just don't say anything. Like, I do not, I, I'm, he's an evangelical Christian, he's, he's pro-life, he's, you know, anti-same-sex marriage, and he just said he would never in a million years ever utter these things on that campus. So... That's happening, right? And that's not, that's not newsworthy. So I think there's a lot of these sort of daily silencings that are happening that are just cre it's created an environment. And that professor actually said in the article for Vox, he said, it's created an environment we cannot get even, we're not allowed to even get our students to think anymore. Because if we say anything that provokes them, you could potentially be reported. Only if it's a liberal, though. He said flat out. If a conservative student complains, nobody cares. And he said, I never once have worried about offending a conservative student. What do you, what's your impression of the numbers? I mean, do you think the illiberal left is the majority of the left, or is it a? I, I personally don't. I don't know. And it's interesting, because Greg Lukianoff and I have talked about this, and I think his sense is that it's used to be true that it was, you know, that they were sort of the, the smaller group of people, but he feels that it's really starting to infiltrate, you know, the you know, not just academia. I mean, my book is a lot about outside of academia as well, um, but that it's becoming more commonplace for liberals to be hostile to free speech uh, and to believe that it needs to be limited to protect marginalized people. Um, I'm still of the opinion that most liberals, you know, at least probably 45 and up, right, are, are, st are still understand free speech and still believe that it should be protected. Do you think that this phenomenon is driven by, in part, by the fracturing of the media? So more uh, than ever, it is possible to go through life without being confronted with views you disagree with. You can now choose your channel and choose your radio station and choose your Twitter feed so that you get only things that reaffirm your worldview. And so maybe uh, college students are shocked when they encounter a view that, they, uh, that uh, disagrees with their priors. The only reason I don't buy that argument is that the conservatives live in that exact same world. So why are the why are the conservative evangelicals at Liberty able to hear Bernie Sanders without having a trigger warning or a safe space set up? Right? You know what I mean? It's not. So there's something else going on, and it's you know there's and and that that the the complaints against the administrators are uniformly from the left. It's, it's not, it's, it's so uncommon. I mean, every, you can find an example here and there, but it really is a certain group of people, and, and I don't even think it's, and, and I want to be clear, it's not all liberal students by any stretch of the imagination. One of the, uh, one of the students that I interviewed for my book was a student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which is actually where I grew up, and my parents were professors at that university for 30 years. 
And she had written a satirical piece for the student newspaper. It was an April Fool's Day issue, and it was mocking the women's studies department. And it was, and it said something about, you know, and in honor of the women's studies department, they're going to build a vagina-shaped building. And this was actually, uh, and and it was, it, it was obviously a satirical piece. A women's studies professor lodged a complaint against the student newspaper with the administration, um, and. Uh, there were multiple complaints, including a Title IX complaint for constitutionally protected free speech. And, uh, and they were investigate, put under investigation for nine months. She, they were accused of se sexual harassment for this satirical piece, of creating rape culture, uh, engaging in sexual slander. And this student had her life completely turned upside down. She, was, she had other professors who sort of harassed her uh, because of this. And the kicker of the story is she is a pro-choice feminist and very liberal. And I said to her, well, what did your pro-choice feminist friends think about your article? And she said that they thought it was funny. And so you can see that it's, it just took one person, literally one person, who decides they're offended. And the only reason that the university ever backed down is because fire got involved and threatened to sue them and said, you are in violation of the First Amendment and you are going, you're going, we're going to sue you. And then they backed off. Had that not happened, they were more than happy to, to treat these students this way. We should say FIRE is a fantastic organization. Amazing. And you should, um, yeah. 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 The, uh, the single best place to learn more about this is FIRE's website yeah. if you're interested. They collect they're these They're heroic. Yeah. I mean, truly. Right. And, and, they're, and, and what's amazing about it is, you know, Greg Lukianoff, who's the head of it, is himself a liberal, atheist, you know, pro-choice, you name it. And he says, I spend all my time defending evangelical Christians and conservatives, sure. you know? Sure. And it's, you know, so it's just, they're, they're just the best. They are. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for helping us to understand okay. what's going on yeah. on campus. That's my yeah. world. Uh, your world is journalism. Mm -hmm. You're a contributor at Fox and uh, columnist at yeah. USA Today. Um, you say in your book that this is uh, this illiberalism is present in journalism as well. So yes. can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I mean, what I'm watching over the last week, and people have been saying, you know, that again, this is all being caused by helicopter parenting, and the, and the little snowflakes can't can't handle uh, hearing differing views. And I'm thinking, well, you know, wherever would they have gotten that idea? Um, and just look at our political debate and look at how Democratic Party leaders and liberal leaders talk about people who oppose same-sex marriage. You know, where did these students get the idea that debate is illegitimate? Well, you know, if you oppose same-sex marriage, you're a bigot. If you uh, support Hobby Lobby, you're a misogynist. If you, you know, if you're a Republican, you're waging a war on women. I mean, this is not something that is limited to college campuses. This is actually how the left Debates issues, you know, and I, they, and in fact, they don't. They say flat out, the debate's over. There's nothing to debate. There's nothing to talk about. And so, it's something that I think has permeated our entire culture. I mean, if you look at what happened to Brendan Eich at Mozilla, uh, you know, where he is forced out of a job for a private donation opposing same-sex marriage. You look at what happened to the Indiana Pizzeria, that you know, they're asked by a reporter, would you cater a gay wedding? Even though who has a pizzeria cater their wedding, I don't know. But you know, so and so they 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 say, well, we wouldn't cater a hypothetical gay wedding. They haven't even been asked to, do, to cater a gay wedding, and you know, the wrath of the gay rights movement comes down on them, and they get death threats, and they have to shut down the pizzeria. I, I mean, this is not something that is limited to college campuses. This is something that people off campuses and adults are doing. You know, it's not in. You know, the people at, 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 uh, at Mozilla, I mean, Brendan Eich founded Mozilla, you know, and no one ever complained about him there. No one ever said he treated gay people badly. And that these people, these adults, these grown-ups, you know, acquiesced to this mob and forced him out of his job. And, you know, he's still unemployed, last I checked. You know, it, it's not, it's, it's just not something that is completely isolated to campuses. And I think it's so prevalent in our media where... Certain views just are not tolerated or taken seriously. The war on women talking point from the Democratic Party, which was literally created at the DNC, was just reported as if it was news, you know, by the media. And, and it's not questioned. And this is, this is an acceptable way to delegitimize entire groups of people for holding the so-called wrong views. What should conservatives and libertarians do about this? 
I don't know. <laughs> No, I think you just you, you have to just keep trying to expose it, and it is, it and for, I do think it is actually going to have to be liberals that are going to be the ones that are going to have to be pushing back against it. Um, I, I think the more intellectual diversity there is, the better it is, which means people have to be doing what you're doing. Frankly, they have to be going into these institutions, even if it's unpleasant, uh, and being there and being the alternative voice. Because um, you know, one of the, st the story I end my book on is uh, about David French, who many of you may know here. Who's he's a free speech mm. advocate, but he also was um, on the Cornell's uh, admissions committee, and he for a lot for the law school, and he talks about how he they they got a student they came before the admissions committee, and he looks at it and he says, you know, this is a slam dunk. Why is this student even before the committee? And then he looks down and he sees that people have written Bible thumper and we don't want this bigot on our campus and the student had gone to an evangelical undergrad. And so when they got to David, David said, you know, if you think this guy's bad, then I'm a fundamentalist. And, you know, David went to Harvard Law. He's obviously, they respect him. He's there. And, and he said that there was actually a real shift in the room where they were embarrassed hmm. uh, and that they realized, you know, that he didn't really fit the caricature hmm. and that they had been wrong and that ultimately they voted to accept the student. Now, if he hadn't been there, that student almost definitely would not have gotten it. And so I do think the more that people can continue, you know, persevere in these environments, the better the, that it's going to be for everybody else. That's right. Uh, I want to say once again that Kirsten's book is a terrific book, and we were delighted that we were able to give out copies of it today. We're delighted also that Kirsten's agreed to sign them in the hall, I believe, immediately after this event, and so you should take advantage of that opportunity. And then if you just please join me in thanking her for being with us.